Welcome to the Rochester High School Repurposing Committee Public Involvement Kickoff Meeting Extraordinaire. Um, uh, I'm Dan McKinley. I'm the town moderator, but I'm not necessarily acting in that role tonight. I just agreed to facilitate this um, committee meeting and this community um, process. Um, so I'll be acting as facilitator. Our um, our objective or our goals for this evening are to kick off the public involvement process for this um, high school repurposing project. And we're going to talk about how we got to where we are right now um, and a process um, lined out for moving forward uh, with repurposing the high school. Um, the goals of the uh, repurposing committee and, and their consultants this evening are, are number one is just transparency so that the community knows what's going on and questions can be asked, questions can be answered. Um, they'll be sharing information about what they do know and taking your questions, outlining where, where they're planning to take this um, process and to listen to you all and, and collect feedback. So those are the goals tonight and I'll be trying to move us through that uh, agenda and those goals this evening. Um, we'll have a presentation, a number of presentations and then a, a Q and A for you all. Um, just a couple of um, maybe ground rules, ground rules that we can use just to keep it orderly. We don't have a big crowd, but still, um, let's use our tried and true uh, skills from Robert's rules. Um, raise your hand if you want to speak, and I'll call on you in the, in the order that um, I see you. Raise your hand. Um, as always, be respectful. Um, take your turn. You know, keep your comments brief if you may, so everyone, if you can, so everyone can have a chance to talk. Of course, no personal attacks. Um, now it's fine to talk about the, um, the ideas, but um, not about the person that's, that's sharing them. Um, there was a, uh, there's a nice little uh, saying that says, uh, respect is the oil that keeps ideas and communication flowing. And if no one knows who said that, I think I'm gonna claim it as my own. I think it's pretty good. Um, respect is the oil that keeps ideas and communication going. So let's have a respectful dialogue. I want to note that this um, is a it's a charged issue for a lot of folks. There's a lot of history, a lot of emotion around um, this building, this place. Um, for myself, I, my kids went through this school, and lots of you went to this school, or your children or grandchildren went to this school. So there's a lot of memories um, right here on this this stage, this auditorium. Um, so I want to be aware of that and want you all to be aware of that as you speak. Um, so tonight as we go through, we'll have, um, we'll have five uh, speakers. Um, starting off is going to be Vic Rabato, who's a co-chair of the High School Repurposing Committee. And Vic's going to share sort of how we got here to where we are today with, with the high school. Um, and then um, Dick Robinson, Dick Robson, excuse me, from Hancock, a retired architect. Um, co-founder of the White River Valley Players. Dick's gonna talk about the building itself um, and the condition of the building. Um, Catherine Shakeman, uh, co-chair of the um, Rochester High School Repurposing Committee. We'll talk about the potential programs that are being looked at um, to repurpose and um, where those came from and, and what will be looked at. And then um, our two consultants, uh, Peter Fairweather is uh, the owner of Fairweather Consulting out of New Paltz, New York. And Greg Gossen is the principal of GBA Architects at Montpelier. And they'll be talking about the feasibility study that's going to look at the potential uses, future uses of the, of the project. And they'll talk about the scope and the timeline of that feasibility study. Um, after each of them have had a turn to speak, I think we're going to hold questions at the end. You're all going to, all going to present. And then we're going to um, open it up for questions and, and answers and dialogue and, and um, just be... Uh, yeah, just getting feedback. Um, with that, um, I think we can move forward unless there are any questions about the, the process, how we're going to do this tonight. Okay. So uh, we'll start with Vic. Um, you want to come up here, Vic? Or, yeah. Oh, hello, I'm, I'm Vic Robato, and uh, please excuse me for reading my comments tonight. I just, there's a lot of 
important details to convey. I don't trust my uh, memory uh, about the details or the order in which they occur, so um, I'm going to be reading. Um, and uh, this will take less than 10 minutes, so hopefully it won't be too big. Can you hear me? I know with mask on, it's a little harder, but pardon me? I'm fine. If you can hear me, that's what counts. Okay, so Rochester High School, which where we are now, was built in 1974, was the site of a junior and senior high school education for the Valley. It also served as a major focal point for the community as both an educational resource and the foundation of a school community that often spanned generations of the same families. It was the site of many community activities and events like the musicals and plays put on by the players, the annual town meetings, school band concerts, soccer games outside, and much more. The events brought the community together and added sustainability and substantially to the uh, quality of life. Following years of changing demographics and falling enrollment, the last class graduated in June of 2018 and the school closed. Following implementation of Vermont Act 46, the Rochester and Stockbridge school districts merged effective July 1, 2018. The newly created Rochester Stockbridge Unified School District Board undertook many challenging tasks to make the merger a successful reality one of which was to decide whether the Rochester Elementary School should remain in the elementary school building or move to the vacant high school building. The school board contracted with Black River Design of Montpelier to assess the conditions of both buildings. Among its findings, Black River advised that due to the condition of the high school building and depending on how it was reused, the capital cost could be anywhere from $300,000 to $3 million. Uh, Dick Robson will have much more to say about the condition of the building in his comments. In the end, the board decided to keep the elementary school building and that continued possession and operation of the high school building was unnecessary. That decision led to a formal subdivision of the high school land and building from the rest of the school property so that another entity, whether the town or a private party, could purchase the high school property. And that subdivision was completed this past spring. The merger agreement that formed the Unified School District allows for the town of Rochester to buy the building from the Unified District for a dollar, so long as it maintains ownership for at least five years and uses it for community and public purposes. From the school board's perspective, it's a costly and unproductive asset that they, quite logically, are eager to dispose of. Even vacant, the building costs thousands of dollars annually to minimally heat and to insure and maintain. But if left unheated in Vermont's harsh winters, even with water lines drained, key parts of the building, heating and plumbing systems would be destroyed and the foundation would likely buckle, according to facilities consultant to the school board. So at the school board's request, the select board agreed to pay up to $15,000 to help keep the high school building during the current fiscal year. A fund drive will take place this winter to help cover the cost with private donations. So what will become of the high school property? One can imagine several alternate future scenarios. And here are four and maybe there are more. It could just be boarded up and left unheated and vacant. This would be the cheapest option, but result in an unusable and unmarketable empty hulk in the middle of town. Two, it could be torn down at a cost of $770,000, according to Black River Design. Three, it could be sold to a private party for some new business purpose. The school board had contacted four commercial real estate brokers this year but none of them saw the potential value as being high enough to be worth their investment of time and effort to make it, to market it. Also, if a third party did buy it, hold on. If a third party did buy it, the town would have no control over what kind of business would go here, so long as it met the zoning requirements. Or fourth, 
it could be acquired by the town and repurposed for some kind of new public benefit function. And that is what we are here to, tonight to talk about. What I have observed of the select board is that they are committed to supporting whatever future for the high school property is in the community's best interest and to give the Rochester voters the opportunity to weigh in on that decision. With that in mind, the select board applied for and won a grant from the Vermont Department of Community Development to assess the financial feasibility of a multifaceted plan to repurpose the high school property. This is to answer the question, is there a way to develop the property that would not saddle the town taxpayers with millions of dollars in capital improvement costs and $50,000 or so of a year of high energy costs? With that grant, the town contracted with Fairweather Consulting of New Paltz, New York, in conjunction with GBA Architects of Montpelier to conduct the feasibility study. You will hear shortly from Peter Fairweather and Greg Gossens, principal uh, with the GDA Architects, about the feasibility study scope and work plan. As you will see, the work plan will take us to the summer of 2022, at which time the select board could put a proposal before the voters. Catherine Schenkman will talk about the specifics of the repurposing plan developed so far, but let me share just a little bit about how that came about. Many of you will recall a local community development initiative called Envision Rochester that ran in 2019 and 2020. Following a series of community meetings and a voting process, repurposing the high school was selected in February 2020 as a top priority for exploration and development. With the blessing of both the select board and the school board, a volunteer committee organized, which Catherine and I now co-chair, to create a concept for what the new purpose might be and how best to serve the community. What evolved over 18 months was the program that Catherine will talk about shortly. And now I'll turn it over to Dick Robson. Good evening. Um, I would like to first show you this is this is the uh, the report done by Black River Design that uh, studied uh, all the school buildings and uh, in some detail and um, and assessed their condition uh, and they're looking at future use and they were always looking at school uses uh, for, for all the buildings, uh, what kinds of maintenance, what kinds of improvements would need to be made in order to uh, decide which of these buildings to keep the school and which to get rid of. So uh, first of all, uh, there, the overall assessment is this is a working building. It has a viable envelope that uh, though it's poorly insulated and so forth, it's, it's there, it's intact. The systems though, fairly antiquated work. So it is a functioning or a functionable building. Uh, there are, however, a lot of issues that need to be addressed. Uh, among the ones that, that would need to be addressed for almost any use in this building are uh, code issues like ADA issues, uh, access issues. The, uh, the bathrooms are not up to code in terms of handicap access. The, there's no handicap access, for instance, from the house to the stage or stage to the music room. Uh, and uh, so those kinds of issues would definitely need to be addressed. Another code issue that would need to be addressed is uh, under fire code, uh, that if I think, I, I believe if we were to renovate more than 12,000 square feet, does that sound right? That, uh, that we would have to sprinkle, have fire sprinklers for the entire building. That's quite a project. Um, 
and uh, there's an apparently emergency lighting upgrade that needs to happen. So beyond those uh, immediate issues for almost any use, we have a lot of issues that should be addressed. And one of the major ones is energy use. This building was built in 1973-74. Uh, oil prices were very low, it was before the oil embargo, as you may recall. And uh, it's very poorly insulated and the, it requires large heating system as a result. So it makes so much sense uh, in a facility like this that we would hope would last for a long time to try to reduce its energy use because uh, rather than looking to find the right kind of uh, fuel, for instance, whether it's electricity, sun, or whatever system, uh, is to reduce the use because that will last as long as the building does. Um, so the, the building needs uh, insulation, roof, walls, the windows are single pane. Um, air sealing is very poor. The wind blows right through here. Uh, under electrical, uh, there require, there's suggestions. I don't know their requirements to upgrade the uh, electrical panels. Uh, that, and, the, um, and the building's systems, the uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems uh, should be replaced. There's an, there are two oil boilers that heat the building right now. Uh, there's a ventilation system, which you have the delight of hearing right now, uh, which, which works, but which really needs to be replaced rather than repaired. The, the control systems for the building are uh, antiquated and uh, need to be up upgraded. Um, and then Another issue that uh, they point out is that part of this building is in the floodplain. And uh, we, we know that from uh, the time of Irene when uh, Irene came through that door and, um, and um, the water was up to uh, row I, I believe, uh, it was destroyed uh, most of the seating in here, the stage, and required uh, complete rebuilding of that and uh, complete uh, re-outfitting of the stage equipment. So um, I won't, I'm not going to go into detail in terms of the uh, cost there. They do have their guesstimates and costs of these various things. And you're welcome to look at this plan if you are interested in that kind of detail. But as I say, their, their estimates are based on this becoming uh, a, an improved educational facility. So we'll have to see what uh, proposals come out in terms of the use here and it, what the effect is on uh, state codes and therefore uh, costs. So uh, be glad to answer questions later on. Catherine. Hello. My name is Catherine Shankman. Both my daughters went to school here. And even my, some of my grandchildren have participated in programs here, Suzuki Institute, White River Valley Players Summer Camp. It's been always a place of, since I moved to town, uh, not only a high school, but a place of social engagement, a place where the community comes together. And it's always been lively here. And it wasn't long before I moved to town because my husband wanted us to move to this town that I 
realized that we all made the best decision. It, uh, it was something I never looked back on once I moved here. You really have a chance to find a place in the community and to have a voice in the community. It's a place where your ideas are welcome and if you have the energy and the stamina, you can develop your ideas. And the uh, engagement uh, workshop sponsored by Envision that uh, Vic referenced was a very important part of what launched our committee work. Because <clears throat> for those of you who didn't go, uh, there was a prioritization process where five different areas of interest were deselected and included in that was arts and learning, was um, family, children and elders. Um, there was business development uh, and the high school was another one. And I think farming was another one and our agricultural aspect of this community. And at the end of that, that workshop sponsored by the Envision, folks got up and said that they've realized that if the repurposing of the high school was done in such a way, it could uh, include all the other priorities that had been established that night. And that pretty much set the direction for the committee who was sitting on the high school, it included me and Dick was there and um, Vic was soon to join us. And some of the people who are in this room were, were there. I think Carolyn, weren't you there that night too? Yeah. <clears throat> so. We've come up with a multi-use plan that has five different components, child care, adult daycare, arts and learning, maker space, which is tied very much into arts and learning, and a co-working spaces, small incubators, co-working spaces. And people are already asking to reserve office spaces for them. In fact, somebody in the post office who who was in the post office with me today earlier couldn't make the meeting tonight and he said do i write a formal letter to the committee to reserve an office space for me so there really is community interest i'd like the word i'd like to know the method by which we should get the word out because the paper is no longer the only way to do it in front page forum and facebook but it seems that these days everybody has a specialized means of communication and we will continue to get the word out uh, we spent the day today uh, with the consultants, each one of the committees, uh, giving them the uh, progress of what these committees have developed. Uh, the Arts and Learning Committee has, they conducted two community surveys and based on the surveys have our developing program, they've identified teachers uh, to, to uh, provide classes based on the community interest they have established uh, fees and class, uh, uh, the class structure size. And so we're hoping that that will get launched before even the, the school is acquired because they've realized that there are enough venues in the town to be able to, uh, to, to uh, start an arts and learning program. And within that committee are leadership from all the long established uh, arts organizations like the White River Valley Players and uh, uh, Rochester Chamber Music Society, Green Mountain Suzuki Institute, which holds a week-long summer camp here. And um, Big Town Gallery is also involved, and so is the Ridgeline Outdoor Collective. We have interest from one planet. And so there's been, and I'm sorry if I'm missing uh, anybody as I say this, but um, unlike Vic, I didn't bring notes. <laughs> and so I think that what is starting will grow. We're, we are bringing people already involved in these things under one umbrella. You might have seen the Hala calendar this summer um, where the libraries were also included from uh, Pittsfield, uh, Rochester, up in Hancock as well. And uh, that's the kind of all-inclusive way we see this. And we don't see this as a Rochester venue in the future. We see it as an asset for the entire Quintown area, a regional resource um, for whatever the building can offer. And if you can just allow your imagination to wander a bit, you know, people being right next to an elementary school, having a childcare center, and also uh, small incubator spaces 
that's a chance for us to my firsthand experience and also to the audience that this is an elder community, folks. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of people that are in need of uh, more care than you can get uh, just based on what's available in the home. And so adult daycare centers, they, they delay institutional uh, placement and uh, they're a place for social engagement and intellectual uh, stimulation for the participants. Um, let me see, the uh, incubator space is successful over in Randolph. We don't even have available office space in this town. So we have 33,000 square feet in this building and I know we can make good use of it. I understand from a recent polling of the community, there's a great interest in a food hub and there's also interest in developing the agricultural lands. So there's a possibility that that can also be included in our component. So this is about a dream and I understand, you know, there's facts, there's figures, there's, there's money that involves upgrading this building but there's also grants and there's very generous federal money coming down the pipeline that we, we really believe we can access to. So I would encourage people not to be discouraged by, uh, by fear of cost. Uh, yes, there's a practical aspect to it, but there are solutions that we don't even know about. I think if, if there's a will behind a dream, then there is the possibility of manifesting it. And I hope that uh, you can get uh, your dreams come alive in seeing your imagination for this very important town asset. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Fairweather with Fairweather Consulting, and with me is Greg Gossens of GBA Architecture and Planning. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, the feasibility study that's going to actually was basically started today. Um, and being a, being a good consultant, I have brought a visual aid with me, which will be projected shortly, which is basically it'll, it'll show you the tasks that are involved in the feasibility study, as well as uh, the timing of it. And it should be up on the screen shortly. If not, there is hard copy available. Um, but basically, as, as we just heard, part of this process of thinking about re reusing a facility is using your dreams and imagination. Um, there's a famous saying about, don't despair if you built your castles in the air, that's where they belong, but just make sure they have a good foundation eventually. And that's really what our role in this process is, is to look at what are the different options that could be supported in this building, and then bring together a couple of things to test that and move it forward. One is, what will the market bear? And we, what we're going to be doing, came up. is it? All right, good. So my role in this process is to really look at the market in terms of demographics, consumer preferences, kind of local stakeholders' interests to see what demand is there, what kind of support is there for certain kinds of services to make sure that if they're offered, there'd be sufficient resources, either through fees or other kinds of financial support so that it can be self-sustaining. So that as these dreams are realized, the costs can be accounted for and can be carried by the community in a sustainable way. Um, and this is the kind of work I've been doing um, for a, a number of years. Um, I, you know, I do economic development, strategic planning, and feasibility studies, and have been, been involved in the adaptive reuse of facilities for a long time, and feasibility studies on everything ranging from an equestrian center to a food technology park to the adaptive reuse of schools. So this is kind of familiar territory. And Greg and I um, just finished a project in West Burke 
looking at ways to help revitalize that village based upon looking at market possibilities and um, what the opportunities are there and then what the physical configuration of the process would be like. Um, and that, that's where Greg's expertise came in. So just to go through this briefly, um, the first task you'll see, which goes through the first three months, is kind of a preliminary break-even analysis. And that's where we're gonna look at, generally, what are the kinds of revenues that are associated with the activities we're thinking about in terms of incubator space, arts programming, um, adult daycare, child care, maker space. And also, what are, the, what are estimates of the operating costs? And again, sort of high level preliminary estimates to see, is this an idea worth exploring? Is it feasible and likely that you're gonna get enough revenue from these kinds of activities to cover the operating costs of the facility? And if we get the go ahead on that after that first task, that it looks like this is something that it's, it's possible, then we start to dig in more deeply into what are the specific activities and what are the components of that spatially that would be needed to be here either through renovation or restoration to um, support those activities. So the first step, again, um, conceptually, is I'll be doing the market analysis. And again, it's looking at demographic trends, consumer preferences, talking to folks in the marketplace about what they see as potential demand for everything from adult daycare, childcare, arts programming, maker spaces, um, and co-working, and then putting together what that mix of uses might look like. And then the next step in that part, as we work hand in glove, is what does that mean in terms of physical facilities? And Greg, you want to talk about your part of this bill? Sure. So once once we start getting a, some ideas on what could happen and what's economically viable and can happen and do some community building with that, um, our studio will start taking a look at how they could fit into this facility. What is the most efficient way to do it? What's the most efficient way to use this facility? It's obviously, you know, Dick pointed out, there are a number of issues with it, but also the bones are really good. It was also, it was interesting, I found out today, it was designed as an open plan school pretty much a failed educational concept, but actually it's gonna serve this purpose well because it's gonna it's basically designed for flexibility and openness. So that's gonna help us a bit, which is really, really good. But we will dig auger in deep with various options on how to rearrange spaces, how to fit the program in. But we'll also take a look at things like the thermal shell, um, start working with energy modeling, some other people to figure out what to do with the building to bring it up to code, bring it up to the current energy efficiency standards, and look at long-term operating costs and making sure that that all balances out too. Our firm specializes in community, community redevelopment projects. We are very fossil in that kind of thinking in those um, lines, and also adaptive reuse projects, which is also nice because when it's a school, you only have really two arrows in your quiver for funding. One is the taxpayers and the other one is state aid to education, which is kind of dried up right now. With the uses we're talking here, all of a sudden your quiver, your, your financial quiver is going to have 10 times that amount, if not even more, potential funding sources. And that's going to be really important. So we'll be taking a look at how all that fits in too. Yeah, yeah so again, just to go over this real quickly, you can see on the, the um, chart up there, we're going to do the preliminary break-even analysis. Then we're going to do the market analysis and look to get that done um, probably about March. Um, then we start to prepare the master space plan. We have an understanding now of what are the sorts of things that are going to happen here. Then Greg works his magic and say, all right, where does it go? How does it fit into the space? And then the master facility plan is, all right, what do we have to do to get ready here? And as Greg said, the good news is this is a pretty flexible space because of the poor educational choice that was made in 1974, I guess. Um, and then, um, you know, we put together the overall operating budget you see in task five and then task six, which, you know, is putting together that quiver. We look at what are the possible funding sources that could be used to make the investment, help defray some of the costs involved with it, and then put this all together in a, a business plan of going forward, what are the uses, how is the building going to be configured? How does this get paid for, both in terms of revenues from the programs and potential funding sources? 
So that, I think, gives you an overview of the process we're going to be involved in, and we'll be happy to take any questions at the appropriate time. Would it be helpful to leave this up or the folks have a paper copy? Or if they can turn the lights up and uh, we'll go into the uh, Q and A. So I think um, our our um, committee members and consultants are gonna just sit up here on the front of the stage and we'll open it up for questions, comments, ideas, dreams. And we have a uh, Molly's going to be running the microphone around. Uh, please wait for it, uh, especially because we're wearing masks. It's going to be difficult to hear folks. Uh, so, who would like to go first? In the back is Martha. And I may not recognize you with a mask, or I may not recognize you, or I may forget your name, even though I've known you for 30 years. Uh, so, please state your name. Uh, um, my name is Martha Slater. I'm But I, I just wanted to make a comment that you never seen. When I moved here 36 years ago, I moved here because my mother's family is from here. That was my calling to the town. But I soon grew to realize that I had a wonderful place for a good place to raise my three children. All of my kids, my school year graduated here, and I have a lot of memories of being in this particular room and over the property itself at sports games, and I can remember it's players. I'm very, very happy to see all the work that's being done to repurpose this school. And I wish I had been allowed to help in any way I can. I just wanted to say that, that it's, it's very hope, a very hopeful thing to me to see this happen. Um, I think it's an important thing because not only is, like as Beth was pointed out, not only is this building part of the school, it's a hub of teaching where a lot of things, a lot of things happen. And I'll thank you. Debbie? Hi, I'm Deb Matthews. Um, and this question is on the articles of agreement. Um, I had looked it up on the um, AOE website this morning, and there's a, another sentence after the sentence about the town has to keep it for five years. And it said if the town um, does not use it for community purposes and they decide to sell it, then they have to reimburse the Unified District for any capital improvements that was made when the Unified District had it. So that said to me that there are a lot of options. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that we're looking at repurposing it, but also it sounded to me like the town could then sell it if if it didn't come through, did, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, yes, I believe is this on? Yeah, I, I believe that's right. Robert Mayer here from the school board is here. Are you right in the room, Robert? He's just playing for He's like that. He's like that. Yes, I believe that's right. Uh, so, yeah, if the, if the plan didn't pan out and the town decided to uh, Sell the building, I believe that is within the uh, the way the town can do that. There's one more uh, caveat there. Uh, there are no improvements that uh, <laughs> there are no improvements that have been made since at this point, so we would not have to re reimburse the uh, the school if we sold earlier than five years. Oh, did folks not hear that? Uh, uh, Robert said that uh, there would be nothing at this point to repay because no improvements have been made. Is that right, Robert? That's correct. Okay. And what's the part about five years? What's the part about five years? Vic, can you talk about the five years? The uh, the town. Oh, you got to read it. You got to read it. 
It says in advance of any of the above school properties shall be conditioned upon the town of city owning and utilizing the real property for community and public purposes for a minimum of five years. In the event the town of city elects to sell the real property prior to five years ownership, the town of city shall compensate the unified district for all capital improvements and renovations completed after the formation of the unified district and before the sale to the town of city. Anybody have any further questions on that point? Okay. Next question. I can't tell who is raising their hand behind your mask. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Hi, Yola Rabeisha. Um, so it's not a question, I just have a comment. Um, I would like to applaud you guys for doing this. Uh, my son was the last graduate of this high school. <laughs> just even thinking about now, it's like I'm being very sad. Because I, I have been on this school board and also a chair for about seven years prior to that. So, um, it was just a whole a very, very sad process. And now I am um, the site coordinator of the uh, One Planet After School program. And and I see how everything is in, goes in cycles, as we all know, like life is in cycles. And uh, we have 20 kids in kindergarten. We have a lot of kids in, in, in all in elementary school. It, this year has been like 20 years, 20 more kids than the previous last year. So the number is growing of the young kids. So I see a, a big progress of this, uh, you know, doing something with their little daycare. I know families with young children. Some of them come to my program, but their younger siblings, you know, come to the door and they could easily, you know, use um, Daycare center. I remember we moved here from Massachusetts, but we moved, we moved the uh, deadline was still operating. And it was so nice to see the kids from the elementary school just walk over to the uh, daycare center. And that could happen again, hopefully. And so there's a lot of it. And I, my last two years in public, um, up in high school building, closed. My uh, our after school program operated at the FTS room next to the auditorium, and so also I heard things about just keeping that part of the building, and I don't know if that's feasible or like you know in the um, might be cheaper, but I, I I just don't know. But I think I'll be so in favor of keeping the whole building, and it just. Like everybody said, a lot of people here said, it brings so many memories. And, uh, and now seeing even this, all this uh, the gymnasium in the uh, elementary school, just the, what it, it, the bleachers are gone. And it just, it's just one more step towards not having community being involved in the school life, in the school, in sports, in, and things like that, you know, it, it just, that's what I like about being in a small community, you know, coming back, coming from Massachusetts. It was just like people were saying that, or Catherine was saying, this is, this is the hub of the community. And it's just like, especially after the uh, high school closed. And I remember the meetings where people were saying, oh, you know, we'll have choice, but people, kids will go, but they will still be in town. They will be still visible. There will be still things going on. Not true. And we all knew it. Because they, they have sports. They come home on a bus from, you know, doing activities in their sports, in their separate schools all over. And they are not visible. There's no young people in, in, in the town anymore. But that, uh, you know, uh, that you do something over there. Uh, you know, so 
So I think you know this this will be maybe bringing more of what you guys were talking about, and I just hope this will all come to fruition. And thank you so much. This is your pleasure. Thank you. I just want to respond. Thank you. Um, one of the visions that we have in the Arts and Learning Center is to create intergenerational opportunities for learning, including the maker space. We're talking about adult education, we're talking about older children education, and we're talking about family education so that a, a parent and a child can actually take classes together. And and, you think, and and the program is not just about arts, we are also developing industrial learning so that you can take carpentry or electricity or plumbing. We even have a local mechanic who's interested in teaching car mechanics for beginners. So, I mean, we talked about actually linking up with, the, um, with other school systems to see if we can be a satellite. And actually, Robert's been working with Jamie on developing that. So, I mean, there's a lot of possibility here. We have a lot of square footage. And we are the only auditorium, the only assembly right now where we're sitting. It's the only kind of gathering like place like this or in the entire Queen Town area. So, and actually none of the other schools in our SU or the district, no, none of the school, you know, this is the only school in the auditorium like that. And it was just kind of, this is just a side of my but. It's been kind of sad to me that Stockbridge wants to unify. The Stockbridge kids don't come here. They, since when the school was still open, the building was still open, when at least this part was still operating. Because uh, there was a plan to do things together. And then it came. There was like a beautiful music room that we could have utilized. That, was, uh, that never happened either. Because it was just a talk of the, the arts, art on the clock, the music on the clock, which is like, you know, to me, it was like, but, um, so that, that was, you know, hopefully this would be, this would happen in some other way. Thank you. Midge, and then Carolyn, and then Larry. Um, I just, you know, I just want to say, Catherine mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of cost involved with the peaceful project, and it is. But I also look at it, and there's a tremendous cost by not doing it as well. If we were to dismantle their school, and there is that notion that that's a possibility, and businesses could come in and take the space, and the town would be all say over what it's done and how it's done to this. That in itself is a tremendous cost to this town. Something we will never do back again. And you know, we talk about how there's uh, when the school was dismantled and everybody went out and did um, you know did the um how it really fragments the school. It's kind of like dropping a stone in the middle of the pond because it just like ripples out into the community and away from the community. And I think, we mentioned this to the, uh, the folks working on the feasibility study, is what's so important in this town that has kept every single one of us here and even brought many of us here was the sense of community. And the school, like the post office, like the grocery stores, like the plays, like anything that has, um, we, we have all benefited. And it was easy to take this for granted when it was here and it was functioning. Well, now without the high school students here, we've really lost a key um, factor of our community. And it's we kind of have this notion now that everybody is out in their different places. But we can, we have the possibility to rework that notion and bring people back to this area. It doesn't have to continue on where everybody gets dispersed. If we want our community to stay as a whole, we have an opportunity to work within the community, create pro 
programs and activities that people want. We all have a say in it. Um, we should have a survey here tonight to get more feedback, but please talk to your neighbors, your friends. This is a reality. We could lose this building. We could lose any potential for carrying on the things in this community that we so love. And this is our chance to show and to act on that commitment. And it doesn't have to come from everybody who's over 65 years of age. It can go into the lower uh, ages as well. So as Kathy said, it's a huge financial commitment to explore this or to move beyond the exploration to actually bring it into fruition, but it is a huge expense to lose it as well. And so I just please speak this up, get people excited, get people help engage people, at least in the conversation of what could happen here, what we want to see happen here, and what the future of our town we what we want it to look like. And that's what I have to say about it. So thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Um Carolyn right down here. I know there's a, a lot of emotional kind of feelings about the building. I'm also thinking we're facing climate change. I mean, it's a serious, serious situation. At the same time, what would the architect proclaim? Have you ever considered of the, is there a possibility of there being uh, this development offer as an alternative to? the regular way of repairing and to get a glance that this would be done in an alternative way so that's an example of how public buildings can be built and cared for and carried on through climate change. I get very concerned about the floodplain possibility and how this building can deal with that. The other thing that I've often thought about is that with the climate change that's driving people from other parts of the world, this way and New England is looking like a very wonderful place to go to. And we may need this back as a school building. It's a classic. Yeah. And we're learning into where these people are going to live, how it's going to affect our forest lands. These are things that have to be considered too, very seriously. And I think that this building somehow be a, an example of how it can be uh, an, an advantage to climate change and cutting down on energy costs and making alternative methods. Is that anything that's been considered? And there must be grants that would be. We'll, we'll definitely be looking at resilience, not just flood resilience, but ecological resilience and community resilience when we do when we do this. So it's definitely going to be part of the matrix as we develop the schemes, and we will be up here presenting different options and different means by which to do it, and just see where the where the uh, where the process takes us. But definitely. I think resilience is really an important aspect of everything right now. And but I do think resilience is a very broad subject and a lot of a lot of what I've been hearing is a lot of this community resilience aspect of it. And I think that's gonna be just every bit as important as flood resilience and, and environmental resilience. But we're gonna want it all. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, Larry, what was next?
Larry Strauss. Um, so I have a question, I guess primarily to the consultant. Um, so I, I'm just curious about the task one um, in the break even analysis. So you have these five or six primary uh, potential uses um, that you're examining. So what happens when you get to the end if you fall below the break even uh, analysis? Um, so is there a mechanism to begin to look at, you know, uh, where you might make up for the missing piece? Um, for instance, you know, does X, X number of square feet need to be used to maybe rent to, uh, to be leased for some other use? Um, you know, say a quarter of the building for some outside use, um, you know, to make up for the, the missing building. Yeah, I think that was a good description, Larry, of what the process would involve. That first step is to really make sure that this feasibility study is worth doing. Um, and, you know, like, just to give you an example, if we say, all right, maker spaces, if, if in order to make this building work, work the maker space needs to have 2,500 members. You know, that suggests it's, you know, this is not going to work and we need to rethink it. And it, it, it. That could involve two things. It could involve retooling the uses to include others, or it could be a situation where, and I, I don't foresee this happening, but you'd say, you know what? Our sort of back of the envelope sketches say, you know, this, we, we're not going to go any farther. Um, you know, I, again, I don't foresee that as not, but that's a, you know, if you look at all these potential revenue sources and they, they're nowhere near what the operating costs are going to be, then, you know, our responsibility is to say this is the situation where maybe it's, we need to rethink this thing altogether. I don't foresee that, but that's really the purpose of that first step is just to make sure that it, this is worth looking at in depth. But you know, the, one of the implications is just as you said, are there gaps in revenue that can be filled by other kinds of uses? You know, maybe even renting a portion of the building out to a regular tenant um, in a separate organization. But so that's that's really what task one is all about. I've got a question for. Uh... Uh, Dick was um, waving around the uh, Black River report. Um, Dick, could that be made accessible on the town website or someplace? That it... I know hard. I know hard copy is in the town office. I don't know if the report itself is posted on the website, but certainly can be. We'll make sure that it is. Yeah. Suggestion okay. if people yeah. wanted to wanted to get to it. Yep. Yeah. The SU, the okay. Well, we can put it on the town website too. Two better than one place to look. Did everyone hear that? It is posted. The Black River report on the facility is posted on the supervisory union website. Deb? Okay. And we'll try to get it posted on the town website as well. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, uh, with a link. Yeah. Or, or just, just saying, like an announcement on front page form that it's now available on the town website when it's there, as and well as the SC. Yeah. Good. Okay, next question. Yeah, right here. I don't know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Deanne Isaacson. I'm the Public Board Chair for the Town of Stockbridge. And I'm also the Zoning Administrator there as well, so I wear a couple of hats. Um, I think my comment that I'm, I want to make about this plan and this program is that our, well, we don't even really have a town. We have a community, and we rely on Pittsfield, we rely on Rochester, we rely on Bethel for a lot of our services and the things we need. Um, however, this particular program could really benefit the kids in our area. And, that, and I'm looking to see that we don't become an aging community where we age out and become the town's guy as a result. Because we already got kind of scooped out by the state with you know, Act 46. 
took away some of our decision making and our choices. We're now working together to correct that and make sure it's a positive uh, result for both communities. And I, I just, I for one, applaud the vision, applaud the steps that this the select board has taken to get the grant block program so that we can do this feasibility study. I would love to see that from the Black River Report on our town site as well. Um, because I'd like our, anyone that's interested in our town that has small children to be able to access that and know what's going on because it's going to impact them. I mean, I'd love to see after, after school activities that our kids can take advantage of, that type of thing. So we, our, our biggest concern right now is the redistricting proposal where they're looking to throw us in with Killington and Menden. And that makes no sense whatsoever. So we got a little battle there we've got to fight because we're already well ensconced with the White River Consortium and with you guys, and we don't want to see that community connection go, go away. Um, it could be very isolating for us, which would not be a good thing. So I just want to acknowledge that. I, I will say as a zoning administrator, I'm seeing a couple inquiries a week for people buying property in our area because they love the area and they want to be here. And the more we have to offer them, even though, yeah, we've got to drive, when you live in Vermont, you've got to drive places to get what you want. This is a close. This is a neighbor, close neighborhood program that everybody can take advantage of. We're an opportunity, let's put it that way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Next. So just a quick. Hi, Bill. Hi, um, I'll, I'll just make a quick comment. For any program, any initiative like this to, to succeed, it's going to require partnerships. So reaching out to Stockbridge is just a logical thing to do. Um, and yeah. we look forward to um, building as many partnerships in this process as we can. Bill? Well, first off, uh, Bill Matthews. Um, but first, I, I wanted to thank all of you for the hard work you put into this uh, this program. It's, these are very exciting times, I think, for Rochester. Not only with this high school repurposing program, but also the uh, Rochester Area Climate Initiative, which is uh, being coordinated by the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And I guess my question or comment is, my, my question is, I, I, will you be working with the Rochester Climate Initiative to try to dovetail programs that make sense for the high school? Um, the food hub you mentioned earlier, which I think would be a natural. Uh, but there could be other things too, like when we talk about uh, having a place to charge electric vehicles. So I think there's a lot of great ideas um, that are going around. And I think it's important. I personally think it would be important to try to dovetail and work with the other group. Yeah, maybe I could respond to that. Uh, Tim Kephart is with us now. He's also a core member of our committee and you know has provides that direct link to the Rochester Area Climate Initiative Program as well as the uh, Valley Climate Initiative uh, Committee. Uh, so we always have just perspective on what we're trying to do. And, uh, and from a physical standpoint, like we were talking today about the possibility of solar power on this building to be able to I obviously well, back here right now. I think anybody out there who can be a partner on this project, what can be talking to? Just point us in the right direction. I mean, because you, you know the castle players better than we do. And you know, and as far as um, energy efficiency and all that other stuff, again, every every aspect of this we're going to look at. Hopefully, there's going to be, be computer modeling at some point in time, energy usage and the like. Um, so, yeah, wh where it takes us, we don't know quite yet. But I mean, eyes are wide open, and every opportunity is going to be followed. I just want to respond that that was one of the first things that John Copens um, mentioned at our first meeting um, at the town meeting of that particular group was 
will we be working in collaboration? And we said we want to be working in collaboration. There's the energy, the multiple, multiple buildings in the town. It's all part from a town's perspective of you know whatever the plan is going forward. Jeff, do you want to speak to any of this since you're here in the audience? <laughs> Well, we do have a lot going on, um, and we do want to make sure that everything is indeed collaborative. Um, you know, we, uh, in addition to Black River analysis, um, the town um, got uh, Energy Investments Incorporated to do a light audit of all municipal buildings, including um, the high school here. So we have uh, more up-to-date estimates of cost. Uh, for upgrades to this facility as well as, as well as other town facilities. Green Mountain Power has reached out to us as well. They would like to create what they call a resiliency zone in Rochester. It's essentially a renewable energy emergency generator for the building. Um, the town does not have a lot of uh, solar appropriate real estate. Um, and so right around the high school here was a, an area that they were interested in using for the solar generation, solar electric generation. Um, there is a, you can get a copy of the audit report uh, at the town office. Um, Julie's been instructed to have those available for folks. Uh, we also have them available briefly if you'd like. Um, there was new activity as of Friday last week. Um, the uh, Request for proposal offers are supposed to be in. Seven of them have come in. One has been given an extension. Um, it's, I won't see much detail on uh, GMP's analysis of all of those offers until this Friday. Um, and uh, of interest, though, is that uh, some of the contractors that would like to build this for Green Mountain Power um, um, are looking at properties outside of town properties as the generation source. So that's a whole new wrinkle um, that might uh, separate some of the um, wishes and desires uh, from the computational respect to uh, a better approach. Uh, I should say that a little further about the resiliency zone. Um, the resiliency zone consists of photoelectric solar panel, um, battery storage, and controls. And in the instance where um, power to Rochester was cut, the electric, the PV panels or the batteries will provide service for the community. Um, how long that service lasts depends upon how much generation and how much storage they install. The other thing that it does is that it allows um, the amount of power, since they give the owners of it, to do what's called peak shading. When they have a high summer or a high winter peak, they can draw power off of those batteries. And that's an approach um, that keeps the utility from having to purchase very high cost electricity. So it, it's, a, it's a benefit to all of us as electric ratepayers. But again, uh, you know, working with my council on the development with the, uh, uh, the town select board and on the repurposing committee. We're all in this together. Hey, um, Mitch, I'll come back to you if there's someone else that wants to go. If no one else wants to jump in, we'll go back to Mitch. Take it away, Mitch. Um, this has uh, a lot to do with what Jeff was just referring to. Um, the whole issue around the GMP and the proposals, um, it is out, the information is out uh, online, and some people have seen it, and a lot of people have it. A lot of people aren't even aware of what it entails, what it's about, and, and it leaves a lot of questions open. So I'm, is there an opportunity, Jeff, that you know of, or anybody else, where, again, we can meet and, and ask, questions on 
this proposal, what it entails, what it, what the benefits are, what what is um, JMP really seeking to do, what are these uh, companies who are setting out the proposals, what are their plans. So we can educate ourselves as a company, what, if, if this is something we even want to um, explore even further, and how much say do we even have? And so there are just so many questions all around this. And I was just wondering, can, can we have a meeting that's specifically designed around information of this? So. Um, as as was done previously, GMP attended virtually a select board meeting to answer questions, and I would anticipate that uh, with now with offers and details in front of them that they will want to meet, and we will encourage them to meet with the select board again. Um, yeah. So I, the select board has been very clear um, that they want the community to understand and to vote on this, that they are not, um, at this point in time, and every time I get spoken to this subject, that they don't want to make a decision that the parents don't agree with. Right, they sort of see that nobody knows about it. That's true. Uh, it's been written up in the paper, though. It's uh, been discussed at all of the meetings that we've been having uh, either through the Rochester Area Climate Initiative or repurposing uh, on the select board's agenda. Um, yeah, I it's been on the, you know, parts of things have been on the porch forum. We struggle for ways to communicate these days. The Herald wasn't the catcher, it was the catcher. Jeff, could you repeat the question? I see the microphone. Online. I think uh, Martha's asking if the um, decision about the resiliency island is going to be something that will come to a town vote on where it would happen, um, if and where it would happen. Is that the question, Martha? Yes, I'm yeah. wondering. Yeah. Could you know that, Jeff or or uh, Pat? I don't know. I can hear the mic, Pat. I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole. It may have some pertinence to if it happens around the, the school, but if it's if it's not, let's not get too far down this um, this topic. Pat, can you give a quick answer? That would probably be a decision that we would have to select for a meeting when we actually see the proposal from Green Mountain um, Howard. They, we, we gave them our blessing to go ahead and explore all the possibilities. Um, if they come back with something that uh, we think that might have any opposition or different opinions or anything, then we could at that time decide to bring it to the town for a vote. Um, we could possibly at this point delay it and make it part of the town meeting. So it's a matter of timing and what, what do they actually come back to us with. Okay, so folks um, stay tuned to uh, select board topics and agenda and you can hear more about it there. Uh, let's get back focused on the on the um, on the school. I, I kind of missed out. Go ahead, Bobby. <laughs> Go ahead, Bobby. Um, so we've got this chart of the um, the month according to past, right? Um, can one of you differ or just speak to what we foresee will be um, our plan mm. while they're working on this stuff? 
how we're going to work on information we're going to gather and um, any other opportunities for more public meetings. Um, how you put in those smart plans. Um, well, you know, I think we're going to be working closely with the committees. I, I was going to mention that because it's something I think this community should be really proud of. Um, the amount of work that the committees have done on these options already is, is pretty impressive. You know, this is a very committed group that's really been um, working hard trying to get the best available information, and, and that'll help make our job a little bit easier. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll coordinate with the committees to see what's the highest and best use of both of our times in terms of this. But yeah, I, I, you know, thank you for the work that's already been done. Um, and I think the plan is to have ongoing um, outreach to keep people aware of what's, um, where we're in the process and, and what we're learning. I, I don't know, Vic, you want to talk about it? Yeah, um, our, our intention is to have public meetings, briefings like this, maybe every six weeks. We're just dividing the time up and being reasonable about you know, the interval. But I mean, you, you know, should expect to have another meeting like this only. You know, hopefully, we'll have a uh, home viewing version as well through Zoom or live stream, something. We just couldn't work it out technically for today, but uh, expect we will in the future. Even if it means, it means going to a different venue to have it. But, uh, our uh, intention is to be uh, transparent and uh, try to demonstrate that by this kind of process and being completely open about what we're doing. How it's going? Take questions and comments along the way. Oh, yes. Who's not on the subcommittee yet? <laughs> <laughs> who, who is, Vic? Maybe we could, if yeah. there are folks here. Great to see who is on a subcommittee. And yeah, just raise your hand if you're involved in the committee of this process. Great. Yeah. Nice. And anybody who has interest in any of these topics we've talked about, you know, maybe you're not interested in maker space, but maybe you are interested in the arts, uh, see me. I'll get you to the right person. All right. I think um, you're not allowed to go home unless you sign up for a <laughs> Um, yeah, you'll let me check and see if anyone else hasn't spoken yet. We have plenty of time, but okay, go ahead, Yola. I just wanted to say real quickly, uh, I'm very happy that you're here, Leanne. If, if there is um, a desire for uh, members of our committee to come and make a presentation to your select board, mm, we've been nice. talking about that. I would love to be able to make those arrangements with you. Okay? Yeah. Nice, nice idea. Okay, Yola. So I don't know how it can be accomplished, but somehow, um, could you please look into making this clear to the public in general that the town and the taxpayers will not be responsible for the upkeep of this building once uh, the you know the activities start going on. But there's, you know, we all know, rumors can be the worst. And I've heard that rumor that, oh no, you know, we'll be paying for this building for years to come, which is not true. But how can we make it clear to people in general that, no, this is like you, uh, gentlemen, were talking about the, uh, will be sustainable. And if we get enough involvement, this building will pay for itself. Be by you know, uh, lease or you know, I mean, you know, I'm talking about so I because this is this is like what bothers me that people don't know, but they assume rumors are going and that can be dangerous. Yeah, I can speak to this. I kind of spoke to this briefly in the opening comment, but just to reiterate, um. We want this to be a financially feasible process that does not settle the town taxpayers with billions of dollars of renovation cost and tens of thousands of dollars of annual um, energy costs. Uh, we hope there's a way to make that happen. That's what we're going to find out through this feasibility process. 
Uh, we don't know the answer to the question yet, but uh, it's clearly in line with what you're talking about here. Right? And there may be even different organizational ways to structure this so that it's not the town, that the town owns it, but it's not responsible for the building. Uh, so. I have a question for Mr. Lovato. Um, <laughs> Can I wait till home? <laughs> I think the question was, how do you get the word out about what you just said? And, and putting it in the Herald and on Front Porch Forum isn't going to be enough. Yeah, we, we have to do more, obviously, by the attendance tonight. We haven't reached far enough, and technically, we didn't uh, have the at home viewing version up and going by tonight, so you're right, we have to do that. I don't know, I'm not sure what those better ways are, but this is a good enough. Um, so I had a suggestion at one point that perhaps we create a, um, a very simple website where we can house all this information um, and where we can share these things so we can point to. Um, you know, if you don't know much about the project or where we're at, hey, here's the website. And it's something that every time we have an article in the paper or do something on the um, front porch forum, someone stepping in completely unknown, it's another spot for them to kind of catch up. Um, you know, we have this meeting and then you know, this is when we're out in the process and what the ideas are. Great. Molly's going to create a website. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a question. I have a call on myself. Go ahead, Dan. Um, in looking at the feasibility for each of these items, I'm thinking about um, you know the uh, uh, administration, executive director type thing, um, facility manager. Do those get rolled into the feasibility, or do we assume that each of those the spaces, makerspace, elder child learning, have come with their own administration and Facility management. And now that's one of the things we're going to look at is the, the what's the management structure that needs to be in place. And maybe they can all be separate, but the initial inclinations, given the complexity of the different operations that are going to take place here and the funding sources they're going to have to manage, having a, a single entity managing the whole process is probably going to be required. And you know that has to be factored into the, the operating costs. Thank you. So follow-up question if I may, them. would you um, think of that as a uh, like a nonprofit or or a town employee? Well, it, it's it's early in the process, but I think the preliminary thing is it would be a not-for-profit. It would be a separate organization that, that might lease the facility from the town be, uh, and, as Vic said, be responsible for the costs and the revenues of the operation, but the town you know, just gets a nominal amount and uh, leaves it up to that organization to make the facility work. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions? I can call on people if that would help. <laughs> <laughs> You know, while I've got you here, has, has any, did anybody come here with a thought or an idea about this building that you haven't heard discussed? That you'd like to just throw it in the mix? Yeah. I, well, I, I had some, uh, some ideas, but I think they're going to be I, I definitely think we should try to, um, as I mentioned before, dovetail with the climate initiative. And part of that is the agricultural community, not just in the five towns, but I think it, it would reach out beyond that. Um, if we were to have a food hub, maybe a place to sell, market um, agricultural products, 
take advantage of maybe the home home ec room and install a commercial kitchen that the farmers could use to prepare foods. Um, it may even have uh, cold storage available. That's just one idea, but you know there, there could be other things too. Um, you know, I, I found some ideas off of that, but, and we'll talk more about that. But I think immediately tying in with the climate initiative and the, the food program and agriculture, I, I, I think that could be a, a, a good program. The, the other thing, of course, is, is electrical, having a charging. You know, we, we've talked about that in the town, having a place to charge vehicles. I think it's, you know, it, it, that would be so good for the town of Rochester to draw people up Route 100, stop in Rochester, charge, walk around town, do business in town, and this might be the location if there's space available. While we're here, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, just a couple ideas, and I'm sure there's many more. Right? And then Ray, and then Pat. Oh, go ahead, Pat, while you're there. Let's do Pat. Better. This is a footnote to Bill's comment. Um, at town meeting, the last town meeting that took place right here, I believe at the very end of the meeting, we had an article that the town voted on, so the select board had to take into account climate change with every decision we made. Um, that's why we have Phil. So, and we do take that into account with every decision we make, um, whether it's perfect or not. We do always bring that up in our decision. So, uh, have no fear, we're, we're bound by town voters asking us to do that. And so, we, and, and we are adhering to that as much as possible. And Jeff makes sure that we do it. Over to Ray over there on the far side. Keep me running, Polly. Um, well, many of us work out of the valley uh, a lot in, in the valley as well. But I don't know if a lot of people know it or not, but we have a lot of people living in this town that work in the Wakefield Valley. And the people up there and in Tillerson are looking for places to store stuff, operate out of, so they can't afford to rent. So they are worth renting now. I think we really need to look at And that's cheap for us to put together. And they need to be advertised up there and in Tillerson. I don't find a great job with that group that we need to do something like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Mitch. Hang on a second, Martha, wait for the microwave. It's hard to hear you. I was going to say, um, certainly now times the people who come down with the Herald does cover 16 towns, five of which are in this valley, and we have that. So we are only concerned with the electric vehicle for publicity, but it's a run. So uh, I've got one. Oh, go ahead, y'all. Just I'm sorry, I jumped in before. All right. Just uh, working in school, I um, I hear you know a lot of stuff, and uh, I know a lot of mothers with young kids, and they take their little kids all over for dance, for ballet, gym, gymnastics, and I know it's hard to get the teachers because I know the uh, Pierce Hall did uh, offer ballet classes for a while, 
Well, I think that what I well, tended to think about, like when I think about, so something along those lines, um, dance slash um, gym. Also, not just for kids. <laughs> I would love to like, do zumba something. <laughs> I've always done that. I love to dance. I love to exercise and stuff like that. So, but in like all generations. Go ahead, Rich. I, I just want to respond a little bit to, to that. One of the things is here Paul has been offering some exercise classes and some of the ballet and whatnot. And one of the things that we do want to make it clear is we don't want the redundancy. We don't want to compete against any aspect of the town uh, activity that's already taking place in the different venues. We want to work in conjunction with different folks. We want to build upon what's already there, but we don't want to compete with anybody. So, you know, maybe that's something that you could talk to Jeannie about. They have a great facility there and encourage her or encourage Pierce Hall to really elaborate on the program, dance program. They have a great space for that and felt that I'm ready to go. So, that's what I have to say. Yeah. Any other ideas? So I mentioned the HALA organization, the Hub Arts and Learning Alliance, which is an umbrella of multiple organizations, but it includes Pierce Hall and Jeannie's in it. And um, members of that committee have worked uh, in response to, to town surveys to develop programming, and dance is definitely on that. So, um, I, I'll jump in with with an idea. I, over the past year or so, I've developed a knee-jerk reaction to any any question that's asked of me. I say housing. And people say, how, "How do you like the Patriots this year?" And I say, "Housing." So, so I don't know um, how it could work or if it could work, but I know that we have a housing crisis throughout the state and in this valley. Um, it's not available, and we want people to come here. We want them to live here. We want families, um, maybe starter level apartments or something like that. I don't know, but um, housing. Yeah, I can speak for you. Uh, that was one of the first things we looked at, just given the dire need for affordable housing in the community. And so we were out here for a site visit to the executive director of Twin Pines Housing, which is the major nonprofit housing developer and operator in Vermont. Uh, we did a walkthrough with him. He looked at the building and his summation was there's nothing about this building that says housing to me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh even if you demolished it and started over again he said it wouldn't have enough uh, capacity to make it economically viable so that was the end of that thanks vic <laughs> <laughs> the truth hurts <laughs> Another committee that's addressing that issue. There, you know, that we, we all see that as being part of the development. That's another spur that's key here. Um, unless we all want to start to buy our homes, you know, we, get, we, we have to look beyond and see what else is available. So there is a committee or a group of people that's trying to explore that aspect as well. And I think that includes yeah, the you know, planning initiative, looking at zoning, yeah, so that we yeah. change, so that some of the plots that we have now might be able to afford to have development on them. Now, this is only something that has been banned. It's nothing but another idea, but this is part of the process that people, you know, express their ideas, and that is should the um, should this building be realized and repurposed, that it's potentially a place where the town offices could be. And then the current town offices could be turned into housing.
Anyone else? Okay. Any closing remarks or what's next? Or yeah, I'll just first of all thank everybody for coming out today. Um, it's dark and cold out. It always is in November here, so <laughs> we appreciate that. And uh, stay tuned for another public uh, briefing and conversation after the first of the year. I'm not sure of an exact date yet, but uh, there will be more after tonight. And then this has been very, very helpful in terms of getting information, helping get the word out. And uh, thank you, and good night.